Blackburn Beverley represented a new era in military transport, but the origins of this remarkable aircraft began with the pioneering work of the glider pilot regiment of the Second World War, and in particular an aircraft known as the Hamilcar, the only example of which can be seen at the Museum of Army Flying in Hampshire. The glider programme as a whole was instituted in order to give airborne forces a bigger punch. The problem with dropping people by parachute, certainly in those days, uh, was that uh, you could only drop individuals and with what they could carry. What was needed was armour. I think the, with the advent of the Hamilcar, which gave us so much more carrying capacity, we were all excited that uh, we had moved up a gear, if you will. And uh, of course, to a young man, given the job of flying one of those, uh, we really felt important. And uh, whatever challenge it produced, well, we think we rose to it. Um, I don't think that any of us considered the future of airborne warfare or, or, or even air transport at that time. We were much too engrossed in the, the day to day of uh, keeping ourselves alive. The development of the glider had two problems. Initially, the glider itself couldn't be recovered, uh, and then they tried to put engines on which weren't really powerful enough to carry heavy loads, and then they developed from that a prototype of the Beverly. The Hamilcar's makers, General Aircraft, began work on the GAL-60 Universal Freighter, which, after the company merged with Blackburn, first flew in 1950. After some modifications, the Beverly was born. I did hear one Royal Air Force officer refer to it as a, a flying block of flats. And uh, it, it wasn't long, however, before we realised it was a serious aircraft that had made a serious leap forward in, cap in load-carrying capability and that uh, even better things could well come from it. It could go off with its crew and land almost anywhere where it had a reasonable flat strip the surface didn't have to be good, it could land on sand, and when it got there, it could operate completely independently. It had an auxiliary power unit inside, which could be started to power a winch, or to even start the engines if the, if the batteries ran down. It had the overhead gantry system, the ramp system, and the pulley system, so it could load and unload any type of vehicle in any part of the country, any terrain, and didn't need the support that so many other aircraft need. It was absolutely unique. The last remaining example is to be found at Fort Paul, a Napoleonic battery on the banks of the Humber, adjacent to the former airfield where this aircraft made its last landing. Brian Rushworth and his family have assembled a team of experts to assist them in a major restoration project prior to opening the aircraft to guided tours for the general public. Uh, it's a fascinating history, even, even delivering cats in Brunei when there was a rat plague and saving the onyx in Kenya and uh, so people just think of it purely just as a military aircraft which of course it was mainly supposed to be but they did so many other interesting things and we want the world to know about it and we'll make sure they do. Well it's just such a huge magnificent sight when you just walk through those walls and you see that just stood there um, you feel so proud and I feel so proud that my family's been involved with it as well and the aircraft seems to be interacting with us. We, see, we feel as if it's part of us. Uh, in actual fact, we must talk about it that much to the point of boredom. I think our friends and relatives are sick of hearing about it, but I just can't stop thinking it's such a wonderful um, thing to do. George West first started work at Blackburn in 1928 and since then has seen many aircraft roll off the production line. She wasn't built to fly fast. She was built to work, and other aircrafts couldn't do it. They couldn't, they couldn't put the equipment in, in the aircraft that we got in here. We've had a bus in there, a single bus, each Yorkshire bus in this, this aeroplane. Oh, we're at the, actually at the, the forward end of the tail boom, uh, near the hatches leading down to the freight bay. Uh, my role when I was in the Army as an air dispatcher, uh, was, I was a corporal crew commander. And particularly in the Far East, we would sit up here while travelling to and from dropping zones. Well, these seats are the paratroop seats. There would be 30 paratroops sitting here and they would go out the hatch 
right at the bottom in the floor. It would literally walk along and drop straight out. Once we'd got the 10 minute warning from the captain, we would come down the side of the aircraft. There was no ladder clipped to a vertical safety cable. When we reached the bottom, we'd go onto a horizontal cable. There'd be a single row of eight containers and I would take up my position here. There would be no back door, 800 feet straight down. Well, when you're standing on the edge of a Beverly doing a one-ton container drop, you're looking straight down 800 feet and you've got a magnificent view at the back of the aircraft, unbeatable, really exhilarating. There's no other way to put it. I think we probably thought it was a noisy, smelly, oily beast. Uh, but we've all got a real soft spot for the Beverly and coming here to see it being preserved at Fort Paul is actually wonderful. And when the Hercules came along, certainly to the Far East in 67, it was a big change. It, it just wasn't as much fun. Well, this takes, uh, takes you back takes a bit, doesn't back. it? A few years, John, doesn't it? Yes. Well, I'll say. The task that the aircraft carried out was fantastic. It could do almost anything that it, you asked it to do. Well, I, the first time I had a ride in the Beverly was when I was a, an air cadet at Abingdon, and Abingdon was regarded as the, the home of the Beverly. And very quickly, my ambition became to join the Air Force and uh, get onto a Beverly squadron. Unfortunately, my aspirations um, came to, uh, to be, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed every hour that I, I flew in the Beverly. The Beverly was in that era, immediately after the, uh, the Second World War, where uh, the aircraft industry, new changes were ahead, but things couldn't happen overnight. So although the basic concept was um, uh, pretty impressive, the technology uh, was still um, uh, wartime. And for the 10 years that the airplane was in service, clearly, the uh, aircraft industry made tremendous uh, steps in uh, uh, designing tactical transports and we're going to have to look at the airplanes in service today like the Hercules which is streets ahead of the, uh, the Beverly in, in many respects. But then again, um, I was also on a Hercules squadron and we certainly couldn't have operated the Hercules from the desert strips that we operated uh, the Beverly because the retractable undercarriage the, the propellers were closer to the ground, the, the fuselage was closer to the ground, and that made it um, so much more vulnerable to, uh, to damage from stones. The short takeoff and landing characteristics, plus the ability to reverse once on the ground, meant that the Beverly was operated in areas previously denied to other aircraft. Uh, this is the flight engineer's seat, and it was an afterthought. The aircraft was basically fitted for two pilots and it, a flight engineer wasn't introduced until they had a major accident which was mishandling of the fuel system in which a lot of people died and the loss of the aircraft. Uh, most of his monitoring was carried out in front on the front panels. This is the navigator's position. Um, the navigator would sit there throughout the flight uh, either working with the electronic aids that were available, or he would be working with dead reckoning using a drift site. Pass up a piece of paper via the engineer to the captain and say, I'm not sure where we are, and I'm not sure how long we've got to go, but it's all right. <laughs> back to back with the navigator is the signaller. Further back is um, the crawlways down behind the engines. You can actually get down through the main part of the wings behind the engines and beyond that there is a thing called the dog kennel. Now the dog kennel houses two overload oil tanks, 54 gallons each, total of 108, which during flight you can transfer oil from those tanks to individual engines as they require it. This aircraft used to burn a lot of oil. The unique task of designing these additional oil tanks, which the chief designer insisted had to be manually pumped, fell to George West. Eventually, I, I thought of an idea. 
Oh, there's a big hole in the front spa. I crawled through there, and when I got in, there was a, another 20 inches diameter hole through the centre rib. And I suddenly had an idea, if I split it up into two cigar-shaped tanks, so that I had one port and starboard. We then had to test it ourselves, and myself and uh, a draftsman working under me flew in the Beverly with Tim Wood, our chief te test pilot, up and down the country, transferring the soil. And uh, that was the pump that's fitted in this Beverly today. It was one of those aeroplanes that um, created a tremendous esprit de corps amongst the crews. They weren't very pleased initially to be posted onto them, but once they realised what the capability of the aeroplane was, then uh, they thoroughly enjoyed their time. It engendered a spirit between all those who flew it and the guys on the ground who maintained it. Everybody loved the aircraft and in turn they liked each other. We all get together and, and tell stories of the times in the 60s and the wives sit there in disbelief believing that these elderly gentlemen did this sort of thing in places like Hong Kong, Australia, uh, Bangkok, etc. around the world. After the Second World War, there wasn't a transport aircraft that could do what this aircraft did. And as soon as it came into service, it was in demand all over the world. People wanted to see the aircraft, they wanted to use the aircraft. It is a classic, an absolute classic. Oh, I go back and fly this tomorrow.